Melissa Lopez Franzen was elected to the Senate in 2012 and was the first woman and the first DFLer to represent the suburban city of Edina and parts of Eden Prairie, Bloomington, and Minnetonka. Last fall, she became the first Latina to achieve a leadership role as Senate Minority Leader. She joins me now to reflect on her decade of service. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Shannon. When you came to the Senate, you flipped a district. Uh, you were the first woman elected to the Senate representing Edina. And upon arrival in the Senate, you were the youngest member of your caucus. You said that you were given the advice to learn the job and keep quiet. In retrospect, was that good advice? Well, learning the job, yes, and I think you, you learn it every year because every year has different uh, challenges, but uh, I did not keep quiet. Uh, I certainly uh, made sure that my voice was at the table, but I did earn people's respect. So I think uh, when you do talk in these forums when you're new, it's learning a new job. And I took my time to learn the new job, build relationships with my colleagues that when I did speak up, uh, they were listening. Fast forward nine years, last September, you were elected to the job of leader of the Senate DFL caucus, the first Latina elected to a leadership role in the Minnesota Senate. During your farewell speech, you said that it is a role that you did not plan for, but that you are grateful for. What has it taught you? Well, Shannon, it's, it's a job that has no job description other than uh, you're the jack of all trades and the buck stops with you. So you are in charge of managing your caucus and uh, being the voice for your caucus, which is very challenging when you have 31 of you and you all have your own uh, perspectives on issues and policy. But it has taught me to be much more patient than I have been with my five and seven year old uh, because you do have to manage through some challenges uh, of whether it's an issue or some uh, issues happening, uh, whether it's policy related or uh, tragedy related, um, whether it's uh, something happening in your community, you just have to bring people together and, and it takes time to, to do that, to build relationships but also solve problems. So it's taught me a lot more patience, which is great because uh, we need to learn how to listen to each other better. That's, I guess, another, uh, another aspect of it, learning to listen and, and everybody's perspective and bringing those voices to the table to solve those problems. Uh, throughout your Senate career, you have sometimes voiced more moderate views in keeping with the balance required of your district. What is the secret to representing a complex constituency? A lot of work, and most of it is on your end to communicate to your constituency and to Minnesotans because you're talking to all, all these people who are watching what you're doing on their behalf and making sure that people know where you're coming from and if you took a vote, why, and making that conversation an open conversation. So I would send literally every week of session of my entire tenure a newsletter to my constituencies with a video and that would open that conversation. A lot of times people say, get me off your list. Other times it's more like, I didn't like what you do, can we elaborate? And it actually helped uh, build that trust with constituents and I'd send it to more than just constituents, but I, I think that, um, helped a lot building that relationship and that trust with my with my constituents. And because you had more political diversity in your district, do you think that helped then when you did earn that leadership role? Yes, absolutely. They knew that I would make the best decision not just for the district but also for the state. And yes, my role is for the caucus, but uh, it's a bigger role when you're one of three people, when I'm talking about the House and Senate uh, and the governor, when you're making those deals and those decisions for the people of Minnesota, they trusted me to make the best decision. And, and they know that I come at, at it from a policy perspective more than a political perspective. So p putting that lens on first of what's best for Minnesota, Minnesota when we talked about reinsurance, which is an issue that I personally don't think it's the best solution to solve health care, but I, I knew the importance of that at the moment. You voiced caution to your Senate colleagues in, your, in the last day of session during your farewell speech about the fragility of democracy, noting that early in your Senate career, the relationships between DFL and GOP lawmakers were stronger than they are now. You also said that you are less optimistic than you once were. In your view, what will it take to fix the divisiveness that is part of politics today? Well, and I think we need to take, look at it from a historical standpoint. I just finished reading uh, a book, uh, Why We Are Polarized by Ezra Klein, and it just refocused um, the issue of how we became polarized. And it's not just in the Minnesota Senate, it's across the country. And bringing the lens of history and data points and, and how people are changing and their issues, um, it just makes it more, um, it makes you understand the issues more of why we're here, where we're at. 
I think what it's going to take is to have more conversations with each other to really listen. We were isolated. Um, maybe you can blame COVID, but we have been isolated politically. And we need to bring people who are coming up to serve in public service and to do it like I am. I'm doing it for 10 years and I'm uh, finding my way out, maybe not because I wanted to, but I know there's another place for me to serve and having more people coming into uh, public service, whether it's elected or in another form, having great candidates. I think that's something that I, I have been really focused on in this latest cycle of election coming up. Uh, so just bringing more voices to the table and, and bringing people and not censoring them, having those dialogues and, and respectful and civil discourse. A healthy balance between work life and personal life uh, is particularly hard to come by during legislative sessions. As a parent of young children during your tenure, you mentioned your five and seven year old, has the culture of the Senate become more accommodating to people with young families or aging parents or, you know, familial challenges? Are there specific changes that you would recommend? Well, it's gotten better, uh, but even when you take on roles in leadership, it, it, your time becomes even more constrained. So um, having a village of people supporting you um, during this last session, which was my first as leader, I had a kid who had to go to therapy, and sometimes I would have to run literally from the chamber, go to Edina, come back to St. Paul in the middle of votes. And thankfully, we have remote voting, so that was, a, you know, that was something that we were able to use, and members from other parts of the, the state could be um, you know, dealing with whatever personal issues they would have. Uh, but I think we, we still need that flexibility. I was just asked today whether we're going to have flexible uh, hearings for committees. I think we should, not just for members, but also for the public to have access to what we're doing. So some of the changes that happened because of COVID, uh, you would like to see ongoing because they perhaps allow for a better work-life balance for lawmakers. Absolutely, and not to abuse them. They would certainly have to be some parameters around it so people don't abuse them, but uh, even for having people to come and testify on a bill to do our job that can't drive here, that can't um, has access to the Capitol, um, but live in uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, we wanna make sure that they're able to participate. So yes, I think some of those things should be uh, a constant and we should adapt to the technologies of the world. Finally, uh, you were not ready to leave the Senate. You've said as much. Um, and in fact, it seemed that your star was still rising. Unfortunately, uh, you made the tough decision not to run for re-election because unfortunately, uh, you were redistricted with a DFL colleague. Uh, so what's next for you? That's a question I've been getting a lot lately. And one of the things I know is I'm gonna go back to my other job. This is a part-time legislature and many of us have another job. I'm an attorney by trade and I have a small business. So I'll go back to that. Um, I also will have the chance to be a professor. So I'll be teaching at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I'll, I'm excited for the next chapter. I'm 42 years old, I have a long runway whether in politics or not, but I will assure you I won't be too far away from politics. It's uh, an important job and I've learned a lot and uh, I don't wanna be away from it. I'm not gonna hide in a cave. <laughs> Senator Melissa Lopez-Franzen, it is a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon.